everyone. Welcome to the Top Ransomware Threats and Protection Summit. Today's event was organized by the hardworking folks at Redmond Magazine, Virtualization and Cloud Review, and AWS Insider, who brought together some of the best independent experts on today's topic. Many thanks to our sponsors, Ignite, A10 Networks, and Zerto for making this event possible. And thanks to you for joining us. I'm John K. Waters, Editor-in-Chief in the Converge 360 Group of 1105 Media. And I'll be your moderator for the first of three information-packed sessions. But before we get going, um, here's a bit of housekeeping I've got to take care of. Each of today's sessions is being recorded for later access. Keep an eye out for an email with a link to that recording. It'll be coming your way within the next few days. Each of today's sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. You can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Don't be shy. Please feel free to add your questions as they occur to you throughout the summit. We'll do our very best to get to all of them. Our sponsors have provided some extra resources that can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, be sure to take a minute to check those out. Uh, at, oh, and at the end of the summit, you'll be asked to take a very short survey. Uh, please take a moment to, to share your honest opinions. Our editors actually read every comment. I'm one of them, so I know it's true. Your opinions help to shape our future events. And last but not least, at the end of the third session, one lucky attendee will be receiving a MetaQuest 2 virtual reality headset. Hundreds of hit games, one-of-a-kind experiences, and a growing community awaits you, but you gotta be here to win, so stick with us. Now let's get started with our first session, Ransomware, what's attacking enterprises right now? For this session, we've called on Alan Liska, Intelligence Analyst for Recorded Future. Alan has seen firsthand the damage ransomware attacks can cause and how ransomware actors operate and communicate with each other. He has written many articles about ransomware and regularly appears on the PBS NewsHour, CNN, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and he's quoted in virtually all of the leading print publications. He's also the author of The Practice of Network Security, Building an Intelligence-Led Security Program, and Security NTP, A Quick Start Guide. There's a reason they call him the ransomware sommelier. I know you're in for a great session. Take it away, Alan. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, uh, as John said, uh, my name is Alan Liska, and I'm an anal uh, intelligence analyst and a ransomware researcher at Recorded Future. Um, and I'm also the author of the book, uh, Ransomware Understand, Prevent, Recover. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of ransomware and how the attackers are coming after you today. So first, let's talk about the number of, let, let, let's talk about what ransomware looks like right now. Um, so right now, what we're seeing so far in 2022 is we've seen about 1,700 victims posted to ransomware extortion sites in 2022. Uh, that is down from last year, which is good, but we also know that Ransomware actors aren't using ransomware extortion sites in the same way they were, so it's not as reliable of an indicator as it used to be. Uh, the other thing that's good is we've seen 32 law enforcement actions uh, taken against ransomware groups in the last 12 months, everything from arrests to sanctions um, to disruption of operations. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing more law enforcement activity involved, which I think is go overall going to be good news, even if it's slow getting there. We're also seeing a change in where ransomware groups are targeting. So for the longest time, the U.S. Uh, made up the majority of uh, victims of ransomware attacks. So if you look even as recently as 2020, um, uh, Try that again. Um, if you look as recently as 2020, 53% um, uh, of ransomware victims were in the U.S., uh, and then another 7% in Canada. So, you know, between the U.S. and Canada, they accounted for more than 60% of ransomware victims. In 2022, so far, the U.S. only accounts for uh, less than 40% of victims. Now, part of that is uh, part of that is that we're um, 
that we're seeing better reporting coming out from other countries. So it's not necessarily that they haven't been victims all along. It, you know, there is the fact that there's more and, and better reporting. But we do see in general ransomware actors expanding their targets and looking in other places for, uh, for victims and unfortunately continuing to find them. <clears throat> we're also seeing a, a rapid change in the, uh, you know, in who's carrying out the most attacks. So if you look overall for 2022, uh, Lockbit accounts for 30% of ransomware attacks, and then you'll see Conti in there at 10%, um, Alfie at 7.7%, uh, Black Basta at uh, 5%. So most of Conti's attacks came very early on in the um, uh, uh, in the year. So Conti was by far the most active ransomware group um, up until um, uh, it was by far the most active ransomware group up until about mid-February. Then uh, a whole bunch of data was leaked, so a Ukrainian security researcher managed to infiltrate, infiltrate the gang and then just shared everything with the world. Uh, that completely disrupted Conti operations. And rather than build back, which, you know, when, um, when a lot of ransomware groups uh, build back, uh, uh, get disrupted, they, they go ahead and relaunch. Uh, Conti kind of broke up into smaller groups. So we're definitely seeing the effect of that. So if you look June through August, you know, through yesterday, um, Lockbit still accounts for 30%, but you see that Alfie uh, accounts for a lot more, Black Basta accounts for a lot more, um, you know, even like Avis Locker and LV uh, ransomware uh, account for um, uh, for a bigger percentage, simply because there is no Conti kind of, uh, 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 there is no Conti um, carrying out operations anymore. So we're seeing these other groups kind of take over. <clears throat> when you talk about industry, um, there is no kind of one industry that is being targeted by ransomware. Um, you know, I know a lot of people don't like pie charts because you see something like this and you're like, well, there's a whole lot of sections that I don't see in there. But I think that this is important because it helps people understand that, um, th that there really is no one kind of standout industry as, oh, this is being heavily targeted um, because they're going after everything. Uh, now, what we are seeing is construction and manufacturing tend to be less well secured with fewer investments in security, so they are getting hit more often. That doesn't mean that they are being targeted more. Uh, education we see as having a big chunk, and, and again, same thing, um, education isn't necessarily targeted more as much as they tend to be less secure, and so the bad guys are able to find vulnerabilities and, and take advantage of them. But the, the, the broad picture that you should take from this is not that these industries are being targeted more, but that basically ransomware actors are indiscriminate in who they go after. They will go after anything and anyone they can. I mean, you know, again, we see this in education all the time where they will hit um, elementary schools or middle schools or high schools. Schools don't have money to pay the ransom. Even if they wanted to, they don't have the extra funds to pay ransom. So going after schools is kind of silly, but yet we continue to see ransomware actors do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, again, um, we are seeing overall what appears to be a slowdown, at least in the middle part of the year. We don't know if this is a temporary slowdown in ransomware attacks, and it's not, oh, my God, ransomware is dead. We can all relax now. No, um, there's still plenty of attacks going on. But when we see a slowdown, we're, we're back to more like 2020 levels instead of 2021, which 2021 was by far the worst year for ransomware that we've ever seen. So a slowdown 
doesn't necessarily mean that ransomware is letting up. It's, it's just not continuing its breakneck pace that we saw in 2020, uh, in 2021. Uh, we are seeing the sanctions have some effect. Um, so we just saw this uh, two days ago where the U.S. Treasury sanctioned, sanctioned, uh, sanctioned uh, uh, tornado cash, which has been used to launder solar, stolen crypto by the North Koreans. Um, these sanctions of not just ransomware groups themselves, but the tools that the ransomware groups use to launder their money are having an effect because it is making it more difficult for ransomware actors to get rid of their money. Um, so we're seeing that. We're seeing that along with the, um, the drop in the price of Bitcoin has... Uh, you know, made ransomware slightly less attractive. Now, what we tend to see, though, is instead of demanding a ransom payment in with a Bitcoin denomination, so instead of saying, I need 44 Bitcoin from you, they tend to, the ransomware actors tend to just now demand whatever money they want in U.S. dollars, but say they want it in cryptocurrency, so either Bitcoin or Monero. Um, so they'll say, I, you know, I, I want a $500,000 ransom paid in Bitcoin. Um, so whatever number of Bitcoin that happens to be on, the, on a given day, that would be the ransom demand. So we are seeing them adjust to this, but, but we do think it is having uh, a, an impact. And, you know, we can talk about indictments. We can talk about the... Um, you know, we, we can talk about um, sanctions, but actually bringing ransomware actors to trial was not something that I thought we would see, but we are seeing that. So there are currently two ransomware actors on trial in the U.S., uh, a member of uh, Rebel and a member of NetWalker. So, um, so it is good to see that. The trials are moving slowly. We'll wait and see what happens. But they're doing more of this extradition. So ransomware actors are finding that if they're staying in Russia, they're probably safe from facing justice. But the moment they leave, um, they are going to uh, they, they're going to wind up uh, captured and probably extradited to a country that is going to. Um, uh, uh, want to punish them, and I think I, I think that is kind of a good thing. It makes it again. If you're in Russia and you plan on never leaving Russia, you're fine carrying out ransomware operations. Um, but if you're an affiliate in another country, you have to think twice because there's real, potentially real challenges, um, and you could wind up in jail. Um, so real, real punishment for your activity. Um, and, and I think that's a good message. And a lot of this is coming from the fact that uh, President Biden set up this 30 country uh, uh, ransomware task force. So there's been a lot of intelligence sharing going on in the background. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of data information is being passed back and forth. And those law enforcement groups have made it, you know, they've made it easier for these law enforcement groups of these different countries to work with each other to not only um, share information about the ransomware attack, but start bringing the, the ransomware actors to justice. So hopefully we'll see more of that going forward. Um, and, and, you know, the concern rightfully that I think a lot of people have with when we talk about these law enforcement actions is, well, wait a minute. Um, if, uh, you know, if, if you capture one guy, there's just going to be another guy that pops up, and it's like playing whack-a-mole. And, and the way I see it is, you know, if you've ever been to Coney Island, you go to Coney Island once a year and you play whack-a-mole, you can get okay at it, but you're never going to be really good at it. If you want to join a professional whack-a-mole league, which I will let you know I made that joke, and it turns out there actually is a professional whack-a-mole league, um, so if you want to know, you can go join a professional whack-a-mole league, also professional uh, cornhole league and professional axe throwing league. So all things that you can do professionally if you'd like to. Um, but the point is that 
if you go, if you want to join the professional whack-a-mole league, you have to go to Coney Island every day and, and, and practice just like with anything else. And I think what we're starting to see with law enforcement is they're getting better and faster at issuing sanctions, issuing indictments, um, extraditing uh, uh, crim- you know, ransomware criminals and bringing them in for trial. And so it's taken a while to get up to this point. What we're getting here, and, and I do think that that's, again, going to have an impact going forward where it's going to be harder for them to uh, – it's going to be harder for them to, uh, uh, to the ransomware groups outside of Russia to survive. Uh, the other thing that's an interesting trend that we're watching is some of these ransomware groups are getting rid of the RAS model. So for years, what we've talked about is ransomware is a service, ransomware is a service, ransomware is a service because that's where everything has been going. And you still see that all of the top groups that we talked about earlier, um, you know, whether it's Lockdown, Blackbass, uh, et cetera, are all ransomware as a service offering. So they're still accounting for most ransomware attacks right now. But what we are seeing um, is some new ransomware variants since January 1st, and that is a lot of the affiliates have decided that rather than, than work for a RAS operator, they want to go out on their own. They don't want to start a RAS service. They don't want to be part of a big conglomerate. They want to be kind of independent and carry out ransomware attacks on their own. I think what's happened is a lot of the ransomware affiliates got spooked by what's happened to Conti, what's happened to Revo, um, and, and, and these big ransomware groups that go after these big targets and then wind up, uh, you know, either in jail or having their operation disrupted um, uh, or taken offline or, or, or whatever, and they want to avoid that by operating on their own. Whether or not that's a good strategy, I don't know, um, but it is something to watch. And what I'll say is that these groups aren't building their own ransomware from scratch, because there's been so much ransomware code leaked recently, most of what we see with these groups are uh, uh, stolen code from other ransomware groups. So we have um, Chaos Builder, which has been out there for a while now. Conti code was leaked. Uh, we've seen Revo code leaked, et cetera. So what these groups are doing, again, rather than building their own ransomware from scratch, they're just taking advantage of the fact that there's been code that's already leaked and using that. We're also seeing ransomware come from other parts of the world. Um, we're seeing more ransomware originate from Iran, China, uh, North Korea, and then collapses with uh, um, in, in which is some care actors in the UK and some in Brazil. Um, a lot of these operations that we're seeing are state-sponsored, but not all of them. Um, yeah, certainly not lapses, but a lot of what we see out of China, Iran, and North Korea is state-sponsored. And you are one of two things. You're either trying to make money because you're a heavily sanctioned country, as in you know North Korea, um, or you are... Um, carrying out state-sponsored operations but making it look like a ransomware attack so you can kind of hide in the noise better. Um, and, and so it is something to keep in mind because the strategies may be a little bit different. If you're hit by one of the Chinese ransomware, um, generally there's no ransom to pay. They, they just want to disrupt your operations. Um, uh, whereas in North Korea, if you're hit by a North Korean ransomware, um, they generally genuinely want to make money because they need money to uh, keep this going. Um, and, and North Korea has been very active in ransomware, um, which is a big problem because there are sanctions against North Korea. And since we know that every ransomware group that we've seen out of North Korea so far is tied to the state, uh, paying the ransom could mean that your organization is uh, going to be fined. Uh, so that is something that you need to think about and incorporate into your tabletop exercises. If you find out that a ransomware group is 
uh, affiliated with North Korea, how does that change? You know, now, I mean, for a lot of organizations, paying the fine may still be a better option than losing however much data. Um, but it is certainly something to think about and, you know, know that if you pay a ransom, you're directly supporting the North Korean regime. Um, and again, that's where we see, you know, law enforcement really aggressively going after this. So, you know, ransomware, uh, uh, the Department of Justice managed to seize 500,000 worth of Bitcoin from North Korea hack, um, hackers behind Maui ransomware. Um, and that tornado catch that I mentioned earlier is have, being heavily used by uh, uh, North Korean ransomware groups to launder, um, launder their Bitcoin before, you know, it's passing the state and used for whatever purpose North Korea is using it for. So law enforcement is aggressively going after these North Korea actors, um, trying to get them shut down and their operations shut down. This is definitely one of those cases where you absolutely want to let law enforcement know if you've been hit by North Korean ransomware because they can take steps to um, to help get the money back. Um, they're, they're way out ahead of most companies and organizations as far as knowing the TPPs and knowing how the, uh, the North Korean um, ransomware groups operate. They've been monitoring them closely. So if you are hit by something and your incident response team tells you, hey, this is North Korean, reach out to, to them. Um, I've even worked in a couple of cases where, you know, law enforcement has said, look, if you have to pay the ransom, you're not going to have to pay a fine for, for violating sanctions because you've let us know and you're working with us. So there can certainly be some advantages to that. Um, you know, nobody wants to force anybody to go out of business. Well, some of the ransomware actors do, um, but uh, but nobody in, in the FBI wants to force uh, uh, users, you know, you know uh, uh, victims to go out of business. So they're going to work with you the best they can to to help you either get the data back, get the money back, or if you have to pay, will help um, help make sure that you know if there is a fine, it's as minimal as possible. Um, Again, the other thing we're seeing, and I mentioned lapses earlier, they're kind of a prime example of this. Um, maybe it refers to extortion-only groups as multifaceted extortion groups. Um, and they're a really big problem um, because they don't encrypt anything. They just steal data and then extort that through the extortion ecosystem, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, you know, they get in generally through either a phishing email or some other kind of social engineering attack. They tend to be really simple attacks. They, they move around the network the same way a ransomware actor does, but then all they do is steal files and log off without encrypting anything until you get a note from them or an email from them saying, hey, I stole a bunch of your data and we're going to post it on our extortion site unless you pay us money. Um, and this is something new that a lot of people haven't really thought about, even though it's been kind of going on for a while. Most of us have built our defenses around stopping encryption and dealing with that how do you deal with a ransomware attack that is extortion only? How do you handle that differently? How does your press team handle that? How does your uh, you know, legal team handle that? Uh, you know, it's something that organizations really need to think about and need to be including um, that when you're, when you're conducting your ransomware tabletop exercises, run through a scenario where it's encryption only. Because often, because a lot of times these these uh, extor multi extortion groups don't necessarily know the network they're, they're going after that well, they may send an email to somebody who's on vacation or who hasn't worked there in three years letting you know that um, they're going to publish your files and, you know, that email is never seen by anybody 
so you don't find out about the attack until you get a call from a local reporter saying, hey, um, your company name appeared on a ransomware extortion site. Uh, what's going on? That's a you know that's an, an awful way to have to find out about it. Um, or you know, a security researcher on Twitter tags your company and says, "Hey, you've appeared on a ransomware extortion site." Um, you know, and that's kind of the way you find out about it. Uh, you really have to prepare for uh, for those kind of attacks and how you're going to address them and how you're going to address when they come in from the different venues. So this was the extortion ecosystem um, that uh, that the ransomware attacks use. We know about excuse me. We know about the sensitive files. We've also seen uh, in in uh, artificial media amplification where they pay bots to retweet stories about um, about a, a ransomware attack or about the you know extortion you know the company appearing on the extortion page. We've seen the ransomware actors launch personal attacks against leaders of the company. Um, they will absolutely reach out to your clients and to your business partners and let you let them know that you've been compromised. Um, they love doing that because then they can get either the clients or the business partners um, and and can advocate for paying a ransom. Um, at least that's the theory. Uh, we've also seen them specifically targeted uh, as the C-suite um, and stealing sensitive files off those boxes. Um, there's a really good article in the Washington Post today from Tim Starks that talks about how uh, some of the ransomware actors use reporters to amplify attacks and kind of get these attacks um, uh, uh, more attention. So that's another way that a lot of this can, um, uh, can be used. But really, you know, that, that that extortion ecosystem has become so important to so many ransomware actors. And, um, you know, again, something to keep in mind, it's not just one or two things. You have to really plan out for how you're going to respond to all of these. All right. So we're going to switch from kind of the ransomware landscape now we're going to talk about sort of the technical side. How are they getting into your network? Um, what, do you, what should you be looking for, and how can you stop the ransomware actors from getting into your network? This is what a ransomware attack looks like. Um, for those of you that have been to these events before, you've probably seen this map. Um, I use this a lot because it's a great way to show just how complex a ransomware attack is, that it's not a single stage that there are all these different components to a ransomware attack, and um, you know you need to protect against all of them. Um, but today we're going to focus just on the initial access, so how they get into the network. We'll start with the obvious: phishing. Phishing is still popular, especially by the larger ransomware groups, but it's not as common as it used to be. Um, renting phishing infrastructure is actually relatively expensive. So a lot of the smaller groups don't want to do that. They would rather, um, if they don't have their own phishing infrastructure, they would rather find other ways to gain access. Doesn't mean you don't have to worry about it. It's still popular, um, still uh, heavily used by, by a lot of the bigger ransomware groups. Um, you know, so <clears throat> with phishing attacks, um, you really need to think about good email security and phishing, phish, phishing awareness training. Now, I know a lot of people like to put a lot of emphasis on the phishing awareness training. I actually prefer the, to emphasize good email security because I find it's better if the phishing email never reaches the employee. If you can avoid that happening, you're going to be a lot more secure. Relying on people whose main job is not security to maintain security awareness all the time, especially at the end of the quarter, the end of the tax season, um, is is really a challenge. So anything you can do to um, anything you can do to limit uh, the email, make sure they never get to the employees, the better off you're going to be. And that's really kind of where you want to think about how you're structuring your uh, your your mail security. 
system is <clears throat> blocking whatever you can um, and then um, hoping that, you know, only a few get through. Um, it also helps when you're talking about fishing, aware, when, when you're talking about the damage that can be done by a fishing attack. In the organizations I walk into give everybody local admin and I understand why. You don't want to have your help desk installing every little piece of software that you know, an employee might need. But if a ransomware actor or other actor can't get admin access to the box they land on, moving around the network is going to be so much more difficult. So if you can limit admin access, you're also helping to restrict the ability of the ransomware actor to move around. Now, there are vulnerabilities that can be exploited. There are other things that the ransomware actor can do to try and get uh, you know, admin access eventually, um, but you're making their job that much harder, and that means that they're more likely to be detected because they're going to have to be a lot noisier in some of the other solutions they have to go after them. So that's phishing. Credential stuffing reuse. Um, we see more of that right now than we do with phishing. Um, different companies have different views, so that's just the view that we see. Other companies may see more phishing than they do credential stuffing and reuse. Um, but credential stuffing, um, right now, again, they're the most common form of initial access, and it's basically because there are so many credential dumps available, often for free, on underground forums, underground markets. So it's really easy to find credentials um, for basically any network that you're trying to scan and then trying to uh, run those. And, and keep in mind that a lot of the credentials that are found um, aren't necessarily leaked from your organization. So, you know, what we see a lot of times is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see people are going to a conference, right? Black Hat is this week. You sign up using your company email and you reuse that password. The black the people who, who manage the event for Black Hat get compromised, then you have a, 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 a data dump that's shoved in some underground forum, and people look for your company name, and they find an employee who then who reused their corporate password for Black Hat events, and they wind up, um, uh, and, and they wind up, um, being able to use that, the, the bad guys wind up being able to use those credentials to compromise your organization. Um, we see these kind of password dumps all the time. So, you know, really, really important to understand how easy it is for ransomware actors to use stolen credentials to gain initial access to a network. That's why there are two things that, that I think are really important here. Um, Monitoring underground forums for stolen credentials. So Troy Hunt has Have I Been Pwned, which is a free service. Um, great service. You put in your company domain, and it'll let you know anytime uh, you know one of you know somebody in you know using your company domain um, had uh, credentials appear in an underground forum, <laughs> and so you can take appropriate steps. Um, so. But it's not just enough to be alerted. You also have to take, you know, action. So if, uh, you know, if an employee credential appears to have been compromised, make sure you get that employee to change the password um, and change it, change it, not just, you know, add another number at the end or something like that. Um, the other thing is this is a great reason for enabling multi-factor authentication. Having that second layer of authentication means that just because the bad guy has a valid username and password doesn't necessarily mean they'll be able to gain access to your network. So anything that you can enable multi-factor authentication, but definitely on any internet exposed system. So if you're talking VPNs, if you're talking um, uh, uh, your remote desktop protocol, Citrix, anything like that, then all have um, multi-factor authentication enabled for them. Third party, we've seen a big growth in third party. It's still smaller compared to the other two, but we have seen a big growth in that. Um, and third party attacks used to be the purview of nation state actors only, um, where 
uh, you know, where they would get in um, and, you know, I mean, like the solar winds attack where they would get in and they would use that access to get access to other networks. So we're starting to see that more and more with ransomware groups where they compromise a victim, realize that that victim has access to all of these other networks, and rather than encrypting the, the initial victim, they just use their access to jump in. Because then you don't have to start from the outside, you get to start from the GUI center. And so uh, it, it's really popular uh, to say, obviously, is a big example of that. Um, but we see that all the time. There was just, um, just this week, there were eight cities in Italy that were hit with ransomware, and they all had a common mass service provider that was compromised and used to deploy the ransomware to these eight cities. Um, so again, we see that increasingly common. Um, so you need to understand, uh, you really need to understand more about how your third-party vendors work, what security precautions they're taking, and then what level of protection you need to have inside your network to protect you from any potential compromise from those uh, 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 from those third parties. Um, you know, we've seen a few of these where, uh, you know, like in, in a couple of hospitals where an RDP gateway was compromised uh, by a third party, you know, as a third party vendor, and the ransomware actors used that RDP gateway to jump into the networks. Fortunately, in both cases, both of the hospitals had good identity and access management, so they knew that this vendor, that this user from this vendor machine, should not be talking to any other computer on the network, and they flagged that immediately and stopped the ransomware attack. Um, so again, good identity and access management is also can also help um, with these kind of things. It may not stop the initial intrusion, but it'll catch it if when they're trying to move around the network. Um, and again, we see this uh, uh, ransomware groups increasingly targeting uh, managed service providers. So know what kind of security routine your managed service providers have and how they protect you if they get compromised with ransomware. And if you ask them this question and they get huffy and say that would never happen, there are 100 MSPs that got hit with ransomware last year. So it can and does happen, some very big ones. So you really want to know what the um, what their contingency plans if that happens, how they're going to keep you safe. Um, you know, and, and again, this was from the uh, Verizon uh, uh, DBR, the, the latest one. Um, supply chain, which is what this is, was responsible for 62% of system intrusion incidents. That's not just ransomware, that's across the board. So really, really uh, keep, keep an eye on your third-party vendors, understand what their weaknesses are, and how they protect you if something happens to them. Uh, exploitation, um, Google Project Zero and Mandiant both reported a big uptick in zero-day vulnerabilities being used in 2021. Um, a big part of this is fueled by ransomware groups, but beyond that, we saw um, initial access brokers and ransomware groups use 50 different vulnerabilities to gain initial access. Anything that is, uh, anything that is internet-facing if it has a vulnerability, ransomware actors are going to try and exploit it. We've seen that with uh, VPN software, with uh, load balancing software, with firewalls, um, with uh, rem uh, des remote desktop servers. So any kind of thing that can be used that, to get the ransomware actors that initial access, they're going to want to take advantage of. Um, so. All, what I can tell you, and it's the same advice you're going to hear from everybody, and so I feel kind of silly saying this, but it's true. Prioritize patching systems exposed to the Internet, especially those are, that are common, commonly targeted by ransomware groups, so again, concentrators, firewalls, citric servers, et cetera. You really need to prioritize those um, exposed systems first because there are so many ransomware groups that can take advantage of any vulnerabilities here. The last thing that we're seeing in terms of um, initial access is insider threats. We haven't seen a lot of this yet, but we know that ransomware groups, particularly um, 
uh, particu- particularly uh, um, Lapsus and um, Lockbit are really interested in the insider threat. And that is they offer an employee money, the employee agrees to click on a link or download something or whatever to give them initial access. That way they can be much more targeted in who they go after and have a better chance of success. Um, Again, we don't know of any successful cases of this. We know of one famously unsuccessful case of this last year with Tesla. Um, where the employee was offered a million dollars to plug in a thumb drive and went to the FBI instead. Um, but the fact that ransomware actors are thinking about this now means that you should be thinking about it too. How would you deal with an insider threat, um, <clears throat> a, a base ransomware attack, and how would you detect that and how would you stop it? This is a rare opportunity where we see a trend early on and possibly – if you think about it now, you may have an opportunity to um, to protect yourself from um, uh, 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 from this as it becomes more popular and as the ransomware groups get better at it. So that's all I have. I'm sure you all are sick of hearing me talk, so I'd love to answer any questions or let John talk for a little bit. <laughs> never, never. You know, it's fascinating to, to learn about the, uh, the fate of the uh, Conti group. Yeah, it really is. I mean, go ahead. No, I was just to say they were like, they were like the uh, you know uh, like the mafia there for a while. Yeah, I mean they were unstoppable, and it all it took was one really determined researcher who was pissed off to take them apart. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of the old adage: "Physician heal thyself." All the big talk that mm-hmm. Conti had about. Um, how you, you should secure your networks better and blah, 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 blah. And it turns out they just left their chat open for everybody and uh, anybody could access the archives and, and, and download it if you were invited in. So, Oops, the Sopranos would never have done that. Right. Um, okay, <laughs> enough of my, enough of my uh, blather here. Uh, let's get to some questions for our attendees. Remember, guys, uh, you can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Do not be shy. We will do our best to get to all of them. So we've got the uh, first one here. You talked about tabletop exercises. So this is from Annie, and she's wondering, can you go into some more detail about tabletop exercises for an extortion-only attack? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think enough organizations do tabletop exercises for ransomware to start with, but definitely not for an extortion-only attack. Um one of those one of the things that you need to think about is who would you get involved with that? Who is most likely to hear about a um, about a ransomware attack and who would they call first? Uh, I had one company I was working with um, that they uh, they had a they had stopped the ransomware attack before the, they, anything could be stolen or encrypted, which was great, um, but it did disrupt their services temporarily. And one of their vendors called the help desk, and they didn't communicate what was going on to the help desk. So the help desk said, I don't know, we have some kind of ransomware attack, and the vendor just shut them off. Um, rightfully so, you don't want the ransomware attack to spread, um, but then the CISO had to take time out of the incident response to go call the vendor and explain what was going on. So make sure as mm-hmm. you're building out these, incident, the, these tabletop exercises that you're thinking about all of your points of initial access for somebody to call in and say, hey, I think you're a victim of a ransomware attack or something, and, you know, making sure that you're communicating properly with those with, with those entry points so that the story is the same across the board. You want to control the narrative. You don't want the ransomware actor to control the narrative. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Okay, we've got another one here from Lee. Let's see here. Uh, who's wondering... Are there any preferred software suites that can detect ransomware threats better than any others? I, I know that sometimes you're reluctant to recommend products, but I don't know. How, how would you answer, Lee? So what I tell people is that um, most, most security suites, when configured properly, can detect ransomware attacks. The problem is the proper configuration 
and then the people on the other end that are monitoring and actually you know responding to the alerts. Um, I never want to advise people to invest more money because you've probably invested a lot of money in your security stack. Um, and if you're happy with your security stack, what I always recommend is stick with what you know and what is working for you now, but bring in your sales engineer, bring in your salesperson and have them do an audit to make sure that you've enabled everything that is going to help you detect a ransomware attack. You know, uh, John, you and I have talked about this before. They will come in, they will mm -hmm. buy you lunch for your team, so you get a free lunch out of it. You may even get a free dinner out of it if you're lucky. Um, and mm -hmm. they'll do those checks for you to let you know, to make sure that you are actually um, have everything enabled that you should have enabled. Um, start with that. And then if you do that and you still feel that it's inadequate, you, you know, I think – the biggest thing, especially if you're you're setting up for threat hunting, is you want to look for an EDR kind of system. So you want to look at a CrowdStrike mm -hmm. or a Sentinel-1 or something like that. When it comes to ransomware protection, if you are if if you've got the staff and the experience for it, you definitely want to have an EDR on the endpoints because that allows you to do a lot of the threat hunting. And then if you don't. Mm -hmm. Um, you you absolutely want to look at outsourcing that capability. So, like, I'm a fan of Red Canary. Um, uh, Red Canary mm -hmm. does a really good job of that kind of detection. Um, Mandian has an MDR. CrowdStrike, again, has a managed service. But that managed detection and response can be um, really helpful. That's neat. Okay, here's a question from Anita. She's wondering, given all the discussion around extortion or backups, still an important part of ransomware protection strategy? The ransomware groups think they are because every recent attack, that every recent successful attack um, I, I've seen, um, uh, they've gone after the backup servers. So, yes, mm -hmm. extortion is becoming increasingly important for ransomware groups, um, but the ransomware groups are still going to go after your backup servers so you should absolutely be backing up, and you should make sure those backups are offline. I can't tell you the number of networks that I've walked into that have had successful, uh, where, where they've been a victim of ransomware attack, but the ransomware attacker has not been able to encrypt the backups because everything was still stored on tape. You know, we think of tape as old technology, but to the best of my knowledge, no mm -hmm. ransomware actor has ever been able to encrypt tape. So, um, <laughs> you, you know... <laughs> Even tape is an offline backup strategy. And so if you have that, as long as it works and you're checking on a regular basis to make sure you can actually restore from it, that's the big thing with backups. Um, you know, that is a good way to, uh, to make sure that you're safe. And, and, yes, so backups are still important. Fascinating. Okay, Femi is asking, what is the best way to handle public-facing applications with regards to ransomware? Um, I, uh, so I'm not sure if you mean public-facing applications that have been hit with ransomware or if you mean um, securing public-facing applications so that they can't be used as a way to gain entry into your network. Um, I'll, I'll answer it both ways because both types of attacks do happen. Um, first of all, you've got to know what you have. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, again, John, you and I have talked about this before. Asset management has been a challenge for the 30 years I've been doing this and will probably be, you know, a challenge for 30 years after I'm gone. Um, but, but asset management is really, really important when you're talking about external facing mm -hmm. uh, applications and device. So you need to have a good inventory of what you have. I recommend mm -hmm. having like a Qualys or a Rapid7 or somebody do external scans so that you, um, uh, 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 so that you know, you may think you know everything, but you want an independent check of that. And then again, knowing what you have, having a constantly updated inventory of what you have, and then, um, you know, and then prioritizing patching those systems as new patches come out. Make sure you subscribe to all your vendor alert notifications for when new patches come out, and so you can kind of get that information there. Um, so, so that is, 
one way to protect yourself. Um, and then, of course, anything that requires authentication, make sure you're using multi-factor authentication. Now, if you're talking about um, external facing applications that get hit with ransomware, a lot of times the nice thing is if they're external facing, it's just wipe and replace. Um, you know, hopefully your data, whatever data that you have is stored not on that device itself, but on a separate database. And so you can just kind of wipe, restore, bring it back online most of the time. But as with anything else, you know, as long as you have good backups on your external facing devices, you're generally fine after a ransomware attack. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Nicholas, uh, not a fan of tapes here. He's wondering, what backups uh, covered by two-factor be better as it relates to recovery. Tapes are notoriously slow on the recovery side. Yep, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 just like with anything else, you go with the backups you have as long as they're working. But yes, uh, uh, restoring from tape is painfully slow. Um, backups with, uh, with two-factor authentication Certainly are better, but there are other ways that you can create immutable backups that don't even that that that, 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 that where you don't have to worry about authentication issues at all. Um, so you can certainly explore some of these other types of immutable backups. Um, you know, with backups, we talked about the three, two, one rule, three copies on at least uh, two different media, one of which is considered mm -hmm. offline. Um, so you know, as with anything else. Um, if you have multi-factor authentication, you're going to be safer. But um, if the ransomware actors are somehow able to get around it, they've then encrypted all of your backups, which is obviously a problem. Um, but, but yeah, you know, some kind of an immutable backup is always a um, is always a best choice. And if it can be disk-based, that's even better um, because mm -hmm. that'll allow you to restore faster. Okay, uh, I think we've got time for one more question from, uh, this is from Annalise. She's wondering, what is the current guidance for how often organizations should have employees change passwords? I'm not, I, you know, it's so weird. We grew up in a time where you got to change your password every 90 days. Um, and then, you know, NIST came out and basically said, well, if you're doing uh, multi-factor authentication, you don't need, we're not going to recommend a, a, a password changing period anymore. Um, I, you know, I still personally change my passwords on a regular basis just because I'm paranoid about stuff like that. But as an organization, mm -hmm. if you have good identity and access management and you're enabling multi-factor authentication, I don't actually think there is current guidance on changing passwords other than mm -hmm. when you know there's been a compromise. But you have to have all of those things um, enabled first. You have to have good identity and access management, and you have to have, um, uh, you, know, you have, to have that multi-factor authentication enabled. Well, my friend, it looks like that's all the questions we have time for. Um, we are going to take a short break now, but we'll be back at the top of the hour for our second session, Expert Best Practices for Ransomware Protection and Recovery, led by IT analyst and founder of Server Storage IO, the awesome Greg Schultz. I just moderated a session with him. He's amazing. And moderated by David Nagel, my colleague, the driving editorial force behind the must-read reporting in virtualization and cloud review. Many, many thanks to Alan Liska for a great session and to our sponsors, Ignite, a10 Networks and Zerto for making it possible. Now would be a great time to check out those extra resources on your console provided by our sponsors. And uh, remember, at the end of our third session, one lucky attendee will uh, be receiving a MetaQuest 2 virtual reality headset. But you must be present to win, so stay tuned. Back in a few. Okay, welcome back everyone. Thank you for being here, and of course, Thanks to Ignite, A10 Networks, and Zerto for underwriting this summit and allowing us to bring you this great content. I'm David Rammel, editor of Virtualization and Cloud Review, here to moderate the second session of today's summit called Expert Best Practices for Ransomware Protection and Recovery. Our speaker for this session is Greg Schultz, an IT analyst and founder of Server Storage IO. 
Greg has worked as a customer in various IT organizations in different roles, as well as a vendor, consulting analyst, and author of several books, including Software Defined Data Infrastructure Essentials, which you can find at CRC Press. He brings a diverse background with real-world perspectives across applications, data infrastructures, hardware, software, and clouds. Greg is also a Microsoft MVP Cloud Data Center Management and previous 10-time VMware V expert. Greg, it's great to have you here. Please take it away. Great, thanks David, how are you? Hello everybody, this is Greg Schultz from Service Forge IO, and we are gonna get underway here talking about how to, actually, this is the uh, portion about expert best practices for ransomware protection and recovery. The hottest third party products will come in a little bit later, so we got a little bit of a uh, goof or typo there on the header, but. What we're talking about today is ransomware protection and recovery. So to do that, let's take a quick step back. Let's take a step back and talk about what it is that we're protecting, then we're going to go into why we're protecting it, then we're going to segue how to protect it, what you can do to prevent, but also what can you do if you are attacked and um, that something does happen. So with that in perspective, the big picture, we're taking that step back, which is data infrastructure. Data infrastructures are what support and host your business applications and your data that transform the data into information services that are consumed by workers, by clients, by customers, by others in different locations, whether they're on site, on prem, whether they're working from home, whether they're mobile, whatever it happens to be. A data infrastructure are the components that can span from edge to the core, on-prem, to the cloud, to a hybrid, to a multi-cloud, but that they're also different layers. So if we look at the slide, horizontally are the different locations where the data infrastructures which are there to exist to support the business app. So again, the horizontal is where these resources are, the hardware, the software, the operating system, the database, file system, repositories, apps themselves, their configuration, the active directories, the main controllers, all those things exist horizontally across our locations, platforms, and venues. Over there on the right is this notion of different elevations, different stack layers, different altitudes, different focus areas. And hopefully this is a pretty straightforward. But the reason we're bringing this into discussion right now is that's the tone on where and what we need to protect because things are being attacked at different layers, whether it's out at the edge, whether it's at the core, whether it's up at the a business app, whether it's on a mobile device, whether it's at the core attacking a router, um, a backup server, database, whatever happens to be. So by having this, we now put in perspective what it is that we need to protect across different layers, across these different locations, venues, and packages. All right, so now let's get into it. The threat risk and focus areas. We're not going to dwell on all the different things that can happen and that do happen other than from a higher level. In other words, there are the current trends the emerging threat, the denial of service attacks, the virus, things that damage, malware, destruction, ransomware, theft, exposure, things that collectively are software defined. Somebody has defined software to go out and do these for different reasons, whether it's damage, destruction, chaos, mayhem, um, or just because somebody can do it, or financial. Then we also have to keep in mind that while the ransomware and the software-defined threats like that do get the headlines, are also the things that can happen and that do happen at different points and at different times, which could be an accidental, intentional, an act of nature, an act of man. It could result in full or partial loss. Um, there's also the external, internal uh, technology failures, technology misconfiguration or omission. So 
again, this notion of different locations to different places things can happen across that horizontal on the bottom there, from the edge to the cloud, all points in between, but also at those different layers from the low level all the way up to that high level. So this prompts that question of what are you protecting, what from, when, where, why, and how? Well, let's dig into this a little bit more. So a couple of things you want to keep in perspective is that what is happening? What is it that you're protecting that could, would, or will, or may happen? And then it's a matter of how you protect against that. Is it full destruction? In other words, physical damage or logical. In other words, something happens to the data or something happens to the applications or the application settings. There's a lot of focus around the data, but there's also, we have to keep in mind that data is just data without the apps that transform the data into information. We need to put some focus on protecting not just the data, but also the applications along with all the settings and all the other components that go to support that transformation information. So are we protecting against full destruction, full loss, or partial damage? In other words, some things are impacted, others are intact. Is it that data is lost or data is corrupted, um, whether it be the apps or the data or the settings? Is it loss of access? In other words, the apps, the data, the settings are all there. They are intact. You can't get to them, whether it's because of a denial of service attack or a network is down or something else is preventing you from actually being able to use those apps and to transform that data into uh, useful information. Um, or is it that you're looking to protect? And all of these are and or. It's not a mutual exclusive. The other part to this is protecting against information leaks or theft. In other words, data that's exposed, data that's compromised, data that gets out into the wrong hands. All right, cool. Let's think about this. One of the common things that occurs is, hey, this is all good. This is all, oh, we really need this. Yes, yes, high fives around the table, yeah. But then somebody says, but how are we going to convince management? Management wants to cut costs. Management wants to reduce the cost of doing things. They don't want to, it's too expensive. So this is where part of the step back before we dive in deeper is looking at it from the standpoint of what are the relative threat risk and business impact balancing the business enabling versus cost savings. So on the left here, think of it as the survival investment. It's that survival investment to keep the business running, keep the business going. And is it the entire business or just four portions that need to be there to keep the business alive, to keep the business solvent? And, you know, traditionally we think faster recovery, which is still very, very important. But we need to shift the paradigm from just simple disaster recovery, recovering after disaster, to resilience where things can happen, but we keep running. We keep running with minimal downtime, minimal disruption. But that evolution from disaster recovery to business continuance, business resilience, you know, throw a new one at you, it's business enablement. In other words, there is a cost to doing this. It's an insurance policy, but it's also an enabler. And it's also how the business chooses to leverage the investment in the protection. In other words, how can it by investing be revenue positive? How does it counter the cost of dealing with an incident or the saving from dealing with an incident? How does it protect the brand, not just the business, but the brand and retain or add clients? If your systems are up and running and your competitors are down, you've got an opportunity to get to gain market share. So, you know, what we're doing here, we're talking business and not technology. Don't worry. We're going to go into the technology here very shortly. But it's part of this whole solution encompasses balancing the business with the technology um, and improving productivity. Over there on the right, it's traditional focus, cost avoidance. And, yeah, there is the impact uh, results to the business, 
but does it address that lost opportunity and revenue, the cost of disruption? In other words, what are those costs? It could be fines, fees, cost to recover, impact to the brand, settlement, cost productivity, among others. And this is where the financial people need to get involved. You need to have not only business, the business units, but the financial people involved because they can run the numbers. They can say that, yeah, if we invest more over in here, we enable the business. Well, maybe the likelihood of that risk is that we can cut some costs. Don't make that decision. Get the financial people involved, get their hands on the decision so that they're involved in it. They're the ones that are looking at things, and maybe it's getting the actuarials involved. But the whole point here is look at it from a business perspective because that sets the tone for where we're going, which is starting to transition into how we're going to use what technology, when, where, why, and how. So often there is this, yeah, but Frank, let's just get to how to use the tool. What's the best tool? What's the newest tool? What's the newest technology? What's that trend that's out there? Well, and tell us how to use it. Guess what? That's what we're doing here. We're stepping back and walking through so that you can understand what to use, when, where, why, how. How to use the tool, best practice policies, so that then you can start pushing the buttons, pulling the levers, adjusting the knobs to use the new technology in new ways, as well as use old technology in new ways, versus the common trend of simply using whatever is new in an old way. All right, so this means business impact analysis, determining your service level objectives, which sets the stage for your recovery time objectives, recovery point objectives, and a lot of other things. No one understand your business, looking beyond the IT spec, but there are different areas. Does everything need to be treated the same? What does the business need versus want? This is a classic. And this is one of those where I talk to some people about it, it's new and revolutionary, to others, it's Asia Vu. So your business units are going to say, we want this. We need this. Guess what? If it's a need, then there is a real demand, which is able to get funding, and they can help you with that. If it's simply a want, it's a wish list, which then becomes harder to justify. If it's an open checkbook, guess what? Wishes do become needs. On the other hand, when budgets are tight, when funding is scarce, that's where you get into the situation of needs one. And this is not just about cost cutting, it's about business enablement, which means increasing spend in areas that can benefit the business from being uh, more resilient, perform better, getting more work done, as opposed to just simply treating everything the same. This is what is needed versus what is wanted. There could be some interesting dialogues there when you get the key stakeholders involved, and that is a recurring theme. Get the different stakeholders involved, get them involved in the decision, uh, because when, then when something does happen, they've been involved. So what are the different threat risks and relative impact to the business? Everything is not the same here. You need to keep all aspects, all apps that support the business online and instantaneous readily. Now, that'd be nice to have, but you need it. Again, this is where getting the stakeholders to walk through and say, yes, this we need, this we would like to have, but also encourage them, challenge them to step away from that simple cost cutting to what if the business were more available in these certain areas. Would that benefit the business? Would it bring um, more revenue in? Would it protect the brand? Would it do all these things we talked about a little bit ago? And get people out of that trap of just thinking, how can we cut costs? I know it's tough, but that's where you have to get the different business units involved and let them make those decisions, and then you can align the technology. So, Everything is a risk, okay? I repeat that. Everything is a risk. However, everything is not the same. There are these different threat risks over there on the left. There are the different bad actors, the actors. They can be people. They can be software-defined ransomware. They can be bots running software that's been defined, configured, created by somebody to attack. Ideally, when those threats come in, the little red arrow, they're bouncing off. They're being deflected. 
are being protected and that you know, workers aren't being prohibited from getting useful work done. But we also want to protect those workers so that they're not attacked and inadvertently inject something into the organization. We need to have that flexibility of the balance of good, strong security protection, um, but with enablement. Yeah, we can lock everything up, but you're not going to get anything done. Um, you can have everything open, but now you're exposed. Okay? So it's a balancing act, and it's a balancing act, again, across that horizontal uh, line on the bottom there, but over there on the right, also vertically. It involves not just only technology and the current trends, but also people, processes, education, and awareness. Let's go a little bit more into this. So what if something happened? What if some malware, some um, ransomware, um, something, a, a, a virus, what if something does get into your environment? One, can you detect it? Do you know if it happened? Do you know when it happened? Do you know if an attack is real or if it's part of a bluff, if it's part of a phishing scheme? Okay? So this will tie into something we're going to talk about in just a moment here is that many attacks, well, they start out in a very non-technical way. In other words, they're phishing attempts, um, getting you to click on something that appears new and useful. I see these daily where things slip through, and it's like, mm, no way is that real because the message is saying, coming from the administrator, that my systems are full. I'm the administrator. I didn't send the email. That's got to be fake. Okay? But here's the thing. What if something does happen at the edge, at the core, on-prem, in the cloud, in a pure cloud, um, on a device to work from home? Of being prepared. Being prepared and uh, being able to do something about it. So again, everything is, not, everything is a risk. However, everything is not the same. Well, let's dig into this a little bit more. What do I mean by everything is not? Well, not all threat risks are going to be the same to your particular environment. So if we look at this, you know, we could do this as a nice build where we have the first triangle on the left of these different threats that come in, and hopefully they're being deflected and bouncing off, or that uh, you're, being, you're giving alerts that, yep, this is something you do need to pay attention to. We've got a new escalation. And then um, we bring in the upside-down triangle in the middle of, okay, all these things are happening, but where are you spending your time? Most of your time should be handling on the exception, those rare isolated events where bulk of things that are happening, there should be less in human involvement, but that's being handled by different technology. Um, MDR, for example, um, uh, Leveraging things like protection, where we're making sure that there are good copies, good backups, good archives. Um, and then leveraging over there on the right, bringing in that other pyramid of having strong policy, having uh, technology that's configured to line up with those different policies that have been determined by understanding the business, by the different business needs, and the applicability to the different business units, to the different applications. Okay, so again, this is part of that. Everything is not the same. Everything is not the same with the different threat risk. Everything is not the same with your different applications and the data, as well as everything is not the same across the business in terms of what needs to be more available, what needs to be more resilient, what needs to be more um, capable. So this is we start to look at it, a couple key things here, that there are these different threat risks, some may get in, it's what can be done to mitigate that. Are they real threats or are they hoaxes? Are they hoaxes to get you thinking that there is a problem that you need to click here to find out where the threat is? Guess what? That's probably a phishing. Don't click on it. So part of this is technology related, having the tools that manage, detect, respond, and that can escalate so here, here is something that you really do need to look at. This does look here to be serious. This needs some uh, interaction. Having your staff 
staff, your analysts, your service providers involved to look at it closer, to isolate pain. Over there on the top right is this notion of rings and layers of protection, that there's multi-layers, multi-rings of protection. Um, you know, we talk about passwords. It's more than just multi-factor authentication. Um, it's more than just simply regularly changing your password. Um, it's doing things where you've got these different layers and rings of protection that as you go deeper in, you need more authentication, that you need that more authorization um, to be able to do certain functionalities. Again, it's prevent and prevent not only something bad from getting in, but also to prevent somebody from simply making a mistake, making configuration. So there are the technologies. There are things including the backup, the restore, the snapshots, the continuous protection. There are things such as the firewalls, um, the network intrusion detection. There are the business policies. So there are these different things that range from the policies that go back to the business at the time on the beginning. There are the technologies and tools. There are the people. But then it starts to come down to how do you align, how do you configure all these different pieces to work, protect, and for the organization? All right. So here's another way of looking at it. And part of this is if we think in terms of data protection and recovery consideration. Now, when I say data protection, that's an umbrella that includes uh, security. It includes um, traditional backup, restore, archiving, snapshots, uh, checkpoints, consistency points. It includes things like encrypting, encrypting data at rest, encrypting data in flight while it's moving over network, encrypting data while it's in memory in, in a, uh, a physical or virtual server for a confidential compute type application. Uh, it's a lot of different pieces. It's protecting not only your backup, it's about protecting your backup software, your backup catalogs, and your backup settings. Not to mention protecting, making sure that your active directory, the main controllers, all the different pieces that need to be present in order for your data infrastructure to be running and for your apps to be uh, running as well. That you've got different alerts, that if something does happen, if something does change that's not permitted, that, that's taken care of. If somebody leaves the organization, that their rights, their roles, their privileges, their access is removed right away. That likewise, you're able to bring on board somebody new. So this goes back to the question of what are the applicable threat risks for a given business, a given set of apps, along with the data? What needs protection, that level of protection, granularity? We'll talk more about granularity here in a um, moment. But it's also how and where to protect, because that ties into granularity. And this is all getting back to the availability, the durability, how you're going to retain, what you're going to dispose of, and doing the different pieces that all come together, implementing these layers and these rings of protection to help protect against different threats, whether they're intentional or accidental different layers. All right, so talk about granularity. Talk about granularity, and what this comes down to, it's a fundamental premise. I learned this decades ago, back when I was working in IT in an organization, one of my directors, you know, he just, this was like a motto, a fundamental premise. You can't go forward if you can't go back. If you can't go back, how can you go forward? Not if, but when, Something happens. In other words, when something does happen, to resume, you need the ability to go back in time. Now, when you do go back in time, this is where granularity will come into play. Do you bring everything back or do you only bring some? So for example, do you bring a full database back or do you need to bring a table back? Do you need to bring back an individual file or an email? Or do you have to bring back the whole email system, the whole file system, the whole volume? Is it just a particular app, or is it a whole app landscape? All the different services, all the different, all the different physical, virtual, and container machines, 
How do you bring those back? How are they? So what this chart is showing is this notion of being able to go back to time. And you have different recovery points. That point in which you can go back in time cover whether it's a small change or a big approach. That you have these different intervals that you can go back and recover from. Okay? These could be just backups, checkpoints, database of a file system, it could be consistency points, um, it could be log updates, snapshots, um, anything involving that point in time. It could be a discrete archive. This is that point in time that you can go back. Oh, so you want to go back, say, a week. Oh, okay, good. Go back a week only to find out that something was corrupted, something was damaged, something was missing. Go back further, and you find out that, yeah, most of it's there, but it looks like something was still damaged. Well, maybe it's that one particular file is but that most of everything else is intact. Or well, maybe you need to go back one further. Well, now this ties back to the different apps. What level of granularity do you need to bring them back? Which ties to that granularity of how you're going to protect? It also ties into the notion of how often you're going to protect and with what granularity. Okay? So it's not just having the copies and it's not just having the multiple copies. It's having the different versions at different points in time with their granularity that allows you to go forward. Again, these are at different layers. These could be at the storage system. It could be at the cloud volume. It could be within the machine itself. It could be the context of your uh, server or app. It could be within a database. It could be within a table. It could be within an uh, individual transaction. But we've got this notion of different layers over and on the right that we've talked about. Just those in mind. And we've got across the different organizations, but also across the different time points. Now, let me mention something here about recovery point and also recovery time. Recovery time is how quick you need or want that particular resource to be back available and usable. That recovery time objective could be how long does it take to get a volume restored or to get a file system restored or the database restored or a table restored. And there could be different recovery time objectives for different components for the different layers. But ultimately, up at the top, it's that user who's going to use the application. What's the recovery time objective holistically for that user that might be longer than what it is for the individual component? So we need to understand and keep them aware is that we've got this flexibility to enable faster RT. But at what granularity and how does that relate to the application and the transactional activity or whatever is in place? All right, so let's build out on this a little bit more. And some of this we just touched on, but we'll just reiterate on. What do you need to require to be protected, and also what do you want? You apply the same protection, same frequency, the same retention, same granularity. Is everything going to be, are you going to do a full backup every day? Or do some things only need a full uh, weekly or monthly or quarterly? If you've got data, you've got apps, but things are not changing on a monthly basis, why are you protecting them weekly? Just so that you can recover faster, and you've got those weeklies that you can go back to. This is part of using the newer technologies, newer types of protection, the snapshots, the checkpoints, kernels, that if need be, you can go back real quick. But if you've got to go back to something more coarse, larger, bigger, that you've also got those capabilities. If you've got these different flexibility at the different layers on how you're going to recover or resume. So where are you going to protect at? What are you going to protect at the core of the edge? But also where are you going to protect to? And where are you going to recover? To? Again, we talked about recovery point, recovery time effects of the RTO. Keep in mind, those can be at a component level. They also need to be uh, a composite 
and how all of those are working together. If the user, if their recovery time objective is, say, 10 minutes, that doesn't mean that the server and storage and the network folks have 10 minutes and the database has 10 minutes and the app people have 10 minutes. No, they don't all have 30 minutes. They all have to figure out what they need to do for their component to meet that holistic RTO. Okay? You want to keep that in perspective. Also, how many failures are you going to tolerate? And again, this ties back to not all threat risks are the same. What's likely to occur, what's likely to impact in different apps, different business units, and the applicable business. All right. Again, this is that shift, old school disaster recovery to new school, current school business continuous to where we're going business resilience to business enablement. So what do we do? Again, here is repeating, enabling that data protection and that granular recovery. You get a notification, you find out that you actually have been infected and that you believe and that you're able to ascertain um, that data is good as of a day of Well, part of that is that you've got that MDR, the, uh, the uh, managed detect on, and you can ascertain that, yes, here is where the problem looks like it occurred, that you're able to, with those rings and layers, isolate, contain um, things from spreading, from getting worse. But now, what do you do with that particular system? Well, you may want to go back further, and you may want to have an alternate system in place, um, set up a virtual environment, whatever it happens to be that is protected, that is safe here, that you can go back and check and verify that the apps are okay, that the data is okay, that the app settings, that none of those have been infected, that none of those have been impacted, so that then you're able to decide what level of granularity from what point in time are you going to use to go forward with? It's the business act going. Likewise, what portions of the business um, can be approved to be able to go back online after they've been checked out? So this is just visually looking at the different granularity from fine grain um, up at the application, transactional logging, journaling, um, a little bit layer, lower down to snapshots, checkpoints, to uh, recurring backups at different layers. This is not a backup versus snapshot versus replication versus checkpoint discussion. This is how do you use all of these complementary ways, okay? And start rethinking things. Now, what usually comes up right about now is, <laughs> okay, this is going to cost us more money. Well, it will if you do all of this in old ways. Even if you use the new technology, if you use it in an old way, it's going to cost you. Part of that means, okay, you've got data that's not changing very often. Why do you have it active? Um, does it not change, but it gets spread a lot during the day? Well, great. Have multiple copies of that, but then put it also on fast storage, feed that up. But does it need to be protected every day, every week, every month? I want to rethink that. Okay? What can be rethought through based on everything is not the same? The balancing act. And as a part of that, you enable the cleaning up, the archiving, or moving data to different tiers of storage that are lower cost, and maybe different locations from on prem to the cloud, or multiple where you've got protection copies in the cloud but you've got local copies, local, as a cache that then can be recovered from. And this is that rethinking and using old and new technology in new ways. All right, so a couple more things there. Again, just reiterating the importance of the frequency, that granularity, the flexibility of user-initiated backups and restores at those different granularities and across those different horizontal and vertical layers. Okay, so let's dig into something here. And what we're going to dig into is gap. There's a lot of discussion when we talk ransomware. It's about, oh, you got to be air-gapped. Okay, great. Air-gaps are good. But let's 
take a little bit step back and talk about data protection and backup gaps. And take out the word backup and put snapshot, set point, replication, consistency point, journaling, in other words, different time intervals. Anyway, there is the good, bad, and the ugly. Good are air gaps, in other words, where not only your data, but the apps, their settings, everything that's required to enable them, that they're isolated, that you've got a copy that's isolated from being online from production. So if something does happen, they can be restored, they can be recovered, they could simply be rolled back or resumed on another system, on another virtual machine or in a container or in a uh, test dev uh, standby environment. The idea is to protect the copies that are sequestered from normal, online, accessible. So when something does happen, you're able to go back very quickly and get that whether it's somebody accidentally deleting something or overwriting it or saving to the wrong place or um, something being infected or corrupted, uh, you're able to resume real quickly. And then there's also time gaps, which is what we've been talking about, these intervals, these uh, the frequencies, the uh, granularity. Those are all just simply those points in time that you can go back to and be able to resume from. The bad, that's when there's a gap in time of missed protection. In other words, something should have been copied, something should have been snapped, something should have been replicated, something should have been logged, but for whatever reason, it wasn't, okay? Um, now, this is bad because you can still detect it, and maybe you detect it the next day or later in the week that a backup didn't run, a snapshot didn't run. The backup, the snapshot, the checkpoint, the journal may have run, but then any data actually get moved because there was an error somewhere else, whether it be in the network, the storage, the server, a write access, whatever it happens to be. And this ties into gaps in coverage, that something was missed, that there's gaps in consistency, that, yeah, something was already infected, something was already corrupt, and yeah, we got copies, that's the good news, and yeah, we got versions, but the data is not intact, okay? If it's in the yellow, you still got that opportunity to detect it and correct it. Now, where things get ugly is where we've got the recovery gaps. In other words, what you thought was recoverable, it was not detected, it was not corrected while it was still in that yellow zone, you've got missing copies, corrupted, damage to bad copies, versions and configuration and other things aren't there. In other words, there's a lack of testing, there's a lack of verification. In other words, you're trusting, but you're not verifying. Well, that's when you get into the ugly gap. How do you, how do you address these? Simple. Trust yet verify. Verify that your protections are working and you actually recover whether it's a backup, a snapshot, a journal, a log point, without overwriting the good data and causing a disaster. So you need to be able to have that environment where you can do that. And this segues into evolving from the old school data protection recovery paradigm. In other words, old school, three, two, one, which is good. If you haven't done three, two, one yet, you should. Because that's the current state of the art, it's the old school state of the art, but we're in the new school, which is going to four, three, two, one. We're adding one more dimension, okay? So the old school is based on having three copies, two or more in different locations or on systems or devices, one of which is off-site. We're gonna change this. And what this means is it's evolving. We've talked about having those versions those different versions, those different time intervals, that different frequency, that granularity. So with 4321, and it's flexible. It's having four more copies or four or more versions with three or more versions or copies. So what we've done here right off the bat is we're introducing it's not just about copies. It's about having different versions along with copies of those versions that if you've got to go back in time, you've, you've got multiple copies to choose from, and that those different copies are on 
different systems, different devices, different platforms, and that at least one or more of them are off-site in the cloud, off-site, offline, on uh, media that's undown or some combination of it. So the whole idea around 4321, it's just adding another dimension that represents not just a copy, but also different versions that you've got copies on. It's spelling out what's kind of implied that you've got copies, but it's making it very focused that it's not just the copies. It's about having those different versions, those different points in time that you can go back to. Now, again, this is what people say, this is going to be really expensive. It is if you go at it the old school brute force, full copy approach. Now, go into this and rethink how you're going to do data protection, how you're going to modernize, what to protect, when, where, why, how. Is everything the same? Does everything need to be treated the same? Can you go in there and reduce the data foot impact, i.e., data footprint reduction, using archiving, compression, cleanup, um, redo, compression, um, thin provisioning, different uh, storage configurations, all those things together will help you reduce your data footprint, which also helps you reduce your cost footprint. All right. So just to reiterate, this is about using new and old things in new ways. In other words, everything is not the same. Why treat everything the same? It's rethinking what to protect, why, when, where, how often, and for how long. How long are you retaining it? How are you going to dispose of um, the data after and recycle the media? It's rethinking how and what to restore, when and where, and what granularity. It's about reducing your data footprint. It's about life beyond DDoO. It's archiving, cleaning, compressing, deleting. In other words, the wide, wide, bigger world of data footprint reduction, which DDoO is a part of, but it's leveraging these other things. And it's protecting at different layers, different levels, to enable that flexible granularity when it comes time to restore and recover. It's shifting from cost of backup data protection to that value of recovery and restoration. And it's also leveraging the cloud um, as well as protecting the cloud in new and different ways. All right, test yet verified. Have an environment that you can test, that you can try things out, that you can also do training and education where people can experiment and learn how to do things. And if there's a problem, it happens there that you're able to regenerate that particular environment uh, without actually causing a problem, and that's the key. Establish a test and training environment and you restore to that location or elsewhere without causing a disaster. And does your recovery, your restoration, recover the A-team, require the A-team, or could one of your interns be able to do it? Can you train somebody else to be able to do it, and how much of it can be done user-initiated? All right. Let's start to wrap up here, and I uh, see we've got some questions in the queue. Again, recap what you can do next. We're going to move into some Q&A here in just a moment. Not everything is the same, so why treat it the same? There's different threat and risks and impacts to different parts of your business and the associated applications, data, settings, and configuration. Gain that situational awareness, that insight in real time so your data is timely so you can make timely decisions. Again, that comes back to knowing your biz, your apps, but also your technology. It's the best solution is the one that works for you. The best settings, the configuration are the ones that work for you. And what that means is keeping those different stack layers keeping those different focus, what we saw on that right-hand side, in perspective across the different environments, the platforms, the locations, which we saw on the um, horizontal. Where to learn more, uh, the information in the rest of the summit, as well as my site, storageio.com, storageioblog.com. Um, check out my book um, at storageio.com slash book. I'm on Twitter. My email address is there. And with that, let's go back to Dave for some Q&A. 
Okay, great stuff. And we do have some questions in the Q&A box. And I'd like to remind the audience that we can take questions up until about five minutes to the top of the hour in order to give you a short break before the next session. So please send them on in now. And let's just get right to them. Greg, if you want to follow along, I'll go from the top down. The first question, I think you touched upon this in your presentation, but can you expand a little more on how do you justify to management the cost of protecting the business? Yeah, um, I love this one. Having been in IT and worked with the business unit, that was a big revelation when we figured out how to do this. You get them at the table. You make you get them to make the decision, um, and you get them to understand and to tell you what the relative impact to the business to a business unit of an app not being there. And again, quantify it with that need versus want. And that when they look at it that, oh, well, is this a need or a want? I want this, but I don't want to pay for it. Their temptation is to try to cut costs. But then you have to show them is that by that enablement, the business is there and what's that impact. They then may be able to work some numbers or have somebody um, run some numbers that may come back and say, you know what, we just realized we may be underprotected. They may come back and say, you know what, we don't need to worry if this is really a wish versus need. Here, we're going to give you this requirement. These are the business units. These are the apps within those business units that have to have this level of availability, this recovery point, this recovery time, these levels of service. Get them to do that for you than simply um, relying on you, because that also tells you how to configure and use the technology. If you just simply say, I am going to configure this the best way possible, guess what? They're going to come to you saying, I want that. Are they going to pay for it? Probably not, but they're going to tell you to cut costs. So get management, get the business holders, get the stakeholders involved. Okay, great. A reminder to the audience, please send in any questions you have because Greg lives and breathes this stuff, so this is a great opportunity for someone to get some expert one-on-one -on -one discourse. And moving to the next question, how important is technology and tools versus training and education of people? I'm going to say, I'm going to take the easy answer and say in a good, balanced environment, they're the same. In other words, if you don't have the training on how to use the tool, the tool is going to get used in an old way, and all you may have is modern tools, modern technology, modern services working in an old way that maybe if you're lucky you're seeing some cost savings, maybe, maybe not. Um, but likewise is you can gain some benefits by just some training, some knowledge, awareness, but you may not be getting all of the uh, benefits. So it really is a balance that the technology needs the people, processes, policies, and how to use them, how to configure them to get the best results out of the combined solution. Okay, great. Next question, Reed. What do you mean by protecting the protection tools? Yeah, I love this one because you think about it is you're reliant on the protection tools, whether it be the backup software, the snapshot, the replication, the firewall, um, the uh, your routers, uh, your different components that are part of that data infrastructure. All right, so what are you doing to protect them? Are you, do you have a copy or the settings for the firewall? Uh, for your different network routers, for your um, Active Directory? Do you, are you protecting the backup software? In other words, do you have copies in different versions of the backup software, the app, but its settings, but also its catalog, its indices, the information that it's actually storing that it needs to be able to uh, restore? You know, a good solution should be able to rebuild itself, but well, you're waiting to recover your business and you're having to wait uh, for the um, 
recovery tool to become available, that may not be a good solution. So it's making sure that not only are your backups protected and, and that they're immutable and all those other good things, but that you're also protecting the software that's needed to enable that, to use that, along with the associated settings and configuration. Okay. Here's a question asking if you could reiterate about the very first thing you should do if you are attacked. Yeah. Make sure that it is a real threat. In other words, if you get one of these emails that says, yep, hi there, you owe me money because I infected your router. All right, stop, take a deep breath, uh, go to your admins, go to your resources, go to your service provider and say, I don't think this is true, can you look into it? Now, if you've got a uh, MDR solution in place, that should have already trapped that, saying, yep, this is a known threat. We've seen this 100 times already today. We ver ver verified that it is a, um, a hoax. Um, thank you for reporting it to us. Um, it shouldn't have gotten through, but it did. In other words, verify that it is a real hoax. Some of the phishing attacks, a lot of them rely on social engineering. They are going to pray on that human element that somebody is going to click or that they're going to tailgate somebody through a physical doorway. It's all about that social engineering tricking you in to uh, doing something. So you want to make sure that it is real, it is legit, and get the appropriate people, whether they're in your organization or if you're at home, reach out to your bank or whoever and saying, is this real? And uh, they'll help you out. Okay, great. There's a question from Yusuf in the audience. He asks, what are the job descriptions of the technical IT personnel in charge of protecting the enterprise from ransomware attacks? Yeah, uh, uh, the CEO. You didn't see that one coming. The ultimate person who is responsible is the chief executive officer followed by the chief operating officer then it's a tie between the chief information officer, um, the chief financial officer, and maybe you have a CSO, uh, CSO uh, chief security officer. Then it could be a three-way tie there. Then it starts to trickle down into through the, uh, the CISO environment, through the audits, the security, the IT. So at those different layers, at those different levels, you're going to have different titles, different people. But I'm throwing that curveball because ultimately it goes up to the CEO to make sure that that organization is protected and invested to keep the business running. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions we have time for. So thanks again for an excellent presentation and answering all those questions, Greg. No worries, Dave. Like I said, it's a fun topic, timely talk, uh, and uh, appreciate spending some time with you today.